Hello and welcome to Vin with the Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guy. It's a phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about season four, episode 11, titled Rock in a Hard Place. See that? See, there's a pun. Rock. Hard Rock place. star. <laughs> hard place. You know, yeah, yeah. It originally premiered on January 22nd, 1988. Hey, surprise. The writer? Dick Wolf. Not surprised. <laughs> I think he really wrote all these. He just put different names on them. Yeah. Yeah. You just looked around the room like, what's your name, janitor? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm putting your name on it. <laughs> <laughs> it is directed by Colin Buxy, who we just saw. He directed Death and the Lady, you know, the porn mm. episode, and Like a Hurricane. Uh, ah. So the first. The first Caitlin episode. Uh huh. Basically, the first half of this episode was yeah. directed by Colin Buxy. So he's done both now. He's finished out his storyline. He's done with on, right. a weird episode sandwiched <laughs> in between them. <laughs> <laughs> He's still got one more coming. Oh, okay. Before we get started, I check in see what's going on in each other's lives. Guys, you know, we've actually picked up a, quite a few subscribers recently. So we wanted to just take a moment to say thank you. Thanks for all the newcomers that have come to the show. Thank you for everyone who's been listening to us since episode one. Thank you to everyone who listens to this podcast, no matter how you get it, when you came in. We appreciate you coming along this ride. And this ride is me and John going through Miami Vice for the first time, not knowing anything about the show to get episode one, going all the way until the final episode and up until the movie. And just our roller coaster ride along with Miami Vice. And possibly the new rebooted version after the movie. We'll see how things go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly yeah. <laughs> and Melissa, who has seen the show at least seven times all the way through <laughs> and is our resident Miami Vice expert and full linguist on Don Johnson hair. <laughs> <laughs> the shaggy mullet, the blow dry mullet. No. <laughs> it just keeps getting longer and longer. I know. Like, it gets bigger. It gets bigger is what happens. The wind drag on his chase scenes <laughs> is just getting horrendous. Pretty soon he's going to wear a ponytail. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, you know, there is a scene in this episode which they make a joke because all that you can see of him in the picture is his mole. His hair. Yeah, they're like, so. good hair. <laughs> nice hair. Well, yeah, we're just excited to do this show. We're doing it. We're watching Vice for the first time through. Melissa's making sure that we uh, understand what the show was actually about and me and John not being too confused at this time that was the mid 1980s i try okay i'm sorry i try <laughs> and, and a lot of things come up in the show that you know uh pop up in regular culture still today i mean we we talk about guest stars who got their start on vice who are still making movies we talk about uh music and all the different cultural aspects and sometimes even unfortunately bad news pops up after someone pops up in an episode, even if it was just a week or two ago. Yeah, we just had our last week's episode. And unfortunately, we find out as of today in this recording that he's passed away. And so we just got to know Arlie. And we obviously, he's been he's in a, huge a bunch of fantastic stuff, uh, including Full Metal Jacket. He was just one of our guest stars last week. Mm -hmm. And here we are. We've unfortunately lost a gunnery sergeant, retired Marine Corp. Drill instructor, guy served in Vietnam, just in, in incredible life. And he, he popped up in some pretty big name stuff, you know, I mean, doing obviously doing the war movies with Apocalypse Now and Full Metal Jacket. But even, you know, stuff on the lighter side, he was in the story, Toy Story 2 and 3, just a great career. And we're really going to. Uh, we're we're going to miss him. A uh, good friend of Vice. Yeah, absolutely. And there is no way to transition out of that. We're really sad to hear about Arlie and Ermi. Um, but let's go talk about this week's episode. All right, John, I'm going to look at my phone the entire time until you start talking about Don Henley, because that's <laughs> not what I'm in here for. I'm here for Don Henley and Dirty Laundry, <laughs> which I found out there's an embargo on you can't find on YouTube. So I had to do some real searching to go and listen to a full version of the song after hearing it in the episode. What else you got for us this week, John? Well, I want to start out with the song I was seeing a moment, moment ago, Don't Dream, <laughs> It's Over, by Crowded House. Crowded House is an Aussie New Zealand band. Neil Finn, vocalist and guitarist, is a New, Ze New Zealander, whereas Nick Seymour and Paul Hester on bass and drums were Aussies. 
They were formed in Melbourne, Australia in 1985 and actually saw quite a bit of international success off of their first few albums and then things kind of trail off from there. The band saw most of their success, their first self-titled debut album, uh, which actually reached number 12 on U.S. album charts in 1987 and provided top 10 hits, uh, Something So Strong and this song most of their success later in their career though was in australia and new zealand their fourth albums actually saw success in uk europe and even south africa ben and hester were former members of a new zealand band called split ends that was actually founded by Finn's older brother tim finn they would form crowded house the funny thing about them being in Tim Finn's previous band was at somewhere around their third album, the band had taken a break after a Canadian leg of their Temple of the Low Men tour. Finn and his brother Tim actually co-wrote an album called Finn. And then Neil would start working the follow-up third album with Hester and Seymour, but what they would give to the record company would be rejected. So Mm. Neil asked Tim, hey man, can I use some of the songs that we recorded on for Finn? His brother Tim was like, oh, you know, jokingly said yes, only if he becomes a a member of the band. (laughs) So in 1990, he officially joined the band as they used multiple songs off of their record (laughs) Finn for their third album. (laughs) He'd actually leave uh, about a year or two later. They would break up in 96. Tim and Neil Finn would go on to do solo work, whereas the drummer, Paul Hester, would actually work with children's entertainers, The Wiggles. He would play <laughs> Paul the Cook. Oh, I know who Paul the Cook is. <laughs> In my the, years of watching The Wiggles. That's the drummer from He would also have his own ABC uh, show in Australia called Hesse's Shed. Uh, I don't want to uncomfortable at all. That I have not seen. I don't know what that is. So, on Hesse's Shed in 1997, it would be the last actual time that Finn, Seymour, and Hester performed together on a stage. They would perform together to promote Neil Finn's solo record that was releasing the following year. Unfortunately, in 2005, Hester died by suicide. Oh, wow. After he died, in 2006, the band would reform with Matt Sherrod taking over drumming. And they would actually release two uh, two more albums, and both would reach number one on Aussie charts. In 2010, the band would, will have uh, had officially sold over 10 million records. Damn. Let's... Move on. Let's talk about Devil with Blue Dress on and Good Golly Miss Molly, which was our second song of the episode by Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels. So Mitch Ryder was born William S. Levi's Jr. He has, <laughs> yeah, no, nothing. No Mitch in there at all. Uh, he, He's released over two dozen albums over more than four decades. His first band, what it, his first band in high school was the band Tempest. They actually gained some local notoriety, and he would eventually change the name to Billy Lee and the Rivieras. They would see limited success until record producer Bob Crew, who would rename the group Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels, would get involved. Crew would uh, really help them get a record contract, and they would end up releasing several hit records in the 1960s. 60s, this song being uh, probably the most notable. In Ryder's heyday, he would actually be the last person to ever perform with Otis Redding. He would perform mm. Knock on Wood December 9th in 1967 on a Cleveland, Ohio local television show called Upbeat. After the show, Redding and four members of Redding's backing band, the Barclays, would die in a plane crash near Madison, Wisconsin on December 10th. Damn. Ryder would end up seeing less success by the mid to late 70s, and he would eventually stop performing with the Detroit Wheels. Uh, He wouldn't stop performing altogether, but he did take kind of a hiatus from music for a while. There's, There's a few biographies out there that say he stopped because he had throat issues Shoes. Ultimately, he would take uh, take up writing and painting and spend some time with his 
his wife in Colorado before jumping back into music in 1983 to release an album that was produced by John Mellencamp called Never Kick a Sleeping Dog. Good, good advice. That <laughs> album would be the last of his albums. Yeah, uh, th- that would actually be the last to score on the Billboard Hot 100 for him. He would continue to and record music and actually release his first album in the U.S. in almost 30 years in 2012. Wow. And finally, that brings us to Don Henry's Dirty Laundry. So I'm Don listening. Henley is in the Eagles. All right, back to you, Dom. <laughs> <laughs> we've talked about our personal favorites from the eagles all right and that's glenn fry he's had a lot of time in vice we've mm-hmm. talked a lot about him it's don henley's turn God damn yeah it. okay <laughs> and don't pick anybody else there is only glenn fry and don henley there is nobody else <laughs> all right so <laughs> Don Henley was a founding member of the Eagles. He was a drummer and co-lead singer from 1971 to 1980. And then he would join the reunion of the band from 94 to 2016. And then they would reform again in 2017 after Glenn Frey's death. Let's just focus on Don Henley for a bit. Start the journey. He was born Donald Hugh Henley in Gilmore, Texas. In high school, he joined a band called the Four Speeds in 1964, would be renamed Felicity. That's a weird change. (laughs) I'm like, that's a weird change. (laughs) That's an odd name. Okay, okay. So, but Felicity would be crossed by fellow Texan Kenny Rogers. And Kenny (laughs) Rogers would take an interest. Kenny Rogers has a big heart. (laughs) (laughs) Kenny Rogers would have to help them change their name one more time, this time to Shiloh, because that's better than Felicity. (laughs) They would become Shiloh, and they would record a few singles for Kenny Rogers, uh, one of which would actually kind of, uh, would actually do pretty good. And actually, before everything was said and done, Kenny Rogers helped get them a record contract. But unfortunately for Shiloh, right before their album dropped, one of their band members, Jerry Surratt, uh, would die in a horrible dirt bike accident. Mm. I don't know if it was a horrible Damn. dirt bike oh, accident. God. I added horrible. <laughs> accident. <laughs> Those goddamn motorcycles they have claimed so many people in this music segment. The accident caused another lineup shuffle. They had just signed with Amos Records. They're in LA. They had this little snafu. In Los Angeles is where Henley would meet fellow Amos record musician Glenn Fry, who was signed as part of a duo called Long Branch Henny Whistle. <laughs> Okay, someone needed to discuss names with these people. (laughs) They were bad. One of the members of Long Branch Penny Whistle would get together with a member of Shiloh, (laughs) who used to be Felicity. (laughs) And somehow they would become the Eagles. Somehow. (laughs) So, but before that, before that, the members of Long Branch Penny Whistle and Glenn Fry would serve as Linda Ronstadt's backup band for a 1971 <laughs> tour. <laughs> After the tour, feeling super confident, realizing that Shiloh wasn't going to get back together, Jerry really held the band together. And so when he <laughs> died in that dirt bike accident, it just, it's tore it just apart. tore everyone apart. Yeah. Yeah. So Henley and Fry would form the Eagles. Obviously, Eagles, they would have a ton of, of major hits the Eagles have sold over 150 million records. 150 million, folks. They've won six <laughs> Grammys. That's like a Grammy every 30 million records. In 1980, they would break up, and Don Henley, as a solo artist, he wouldn't do so bad himself. In fact, he would sell over 10 million as a solo artist, including eight top 40 hits and two Grammys. Yeah, not bad. Not shabby. <laughs> I, I think up, two, two Grammys compared to the six Grammys would mean Don Henley was essentially one for the Eagles. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think that's an accurate statement. 
After the Eagles broke up, Henley would go solo. So would Walsh. He's had a, a pretty good, successful career. He's had some pretty big hits. So Dirty Laundry was actually his biggest hit because that got him in, uh, up to number three on the charts. My favorite solo song of his, The Boys of Summer, got him to number five. You know, I would say The Boys of Summer would be my favorite H- H- Henley song too, too. Except for the goddamn San Francisco Giants used that song in all of their promos, and I hate the Giants. Yeah, that's I hate true. them. They did ruin it. And uh-huh. so it's ruined that song for me. <laughs> what about a New York Minute? Come on, people. That's an amazing song. <laughs> now, let's just take it back. So in 1980, after the Eagles break up, the first thing Don Henley actually did was he recorded a duet with his then-girlfriend, Stevie Nicks, mm. mm-hmm. called Leather and Lace. That song would actually make the top 10 on the adult contemporary charts. Then he would release his first solo album, which would contain Dirty Laundry, which would hit number three on the Hot 100. Later, he would also hit number three on the rock chart with Who Owns This Plane, that would also be that would be from the 1986 The Color of Money soundtrack. Mm. As I like to do, ultimately he he continues to make solo music. In fact, he's he released albums in 2011 and 2015. I mean, he's recently released solo music. Two other things about Don Henley's story: numerous upon numerous legal battles with his Geffen label. He was always, they were suing him or he was suing them. Just never go along with David Geffen. And then one thing that I read and I thought was very strange, I I think would be a a lot bigger deal these days. In 1980, Don Henley called paramedics to his home where a 16-year-old naked girl was found claiming to be overdosing on quaaludes and cocaine she would have she would be actually arrested that night she would actually be arrested that night for prostitution at the (laughs) same time a 15 year old girl found in that same home would be arrested for being under the influence of drugs henley later not that night but later be charged with contributing to the delinquency of a minor he would receive a twenty five hundred dollar fine and two years probation Holy shit. How does that work? Hmm. How does that work? I don't know. (laughs) Just tell me. Tell me. Tell me how it, 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 I mean, this, how could this happen like now? Just imagine your favorite rock star pops, uh, or pop star calls the police. They show up. There are two naked, underage uh, women there, high on drugs. The rest of the two underage naked women, but, but not the pop star or rock star and later they just give them a little fine for you know giving drugs to the minors wow <laughs> yeah that wouldn't happen nowadays <laughs> oh, wow is he still your favorite eagle dominic <laughs> <laughs> All right, John. Well, of course, the music segment always takes a turn right at the end. <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. I got many. I'll okay. bet. <laughs> and that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. As always, we would love to hear from you. Email us, goWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Get us on Twitter at go with the heat. Instagram at go with the heat. Facebook.com slash go with the heat anchor FM stitcher YouTube you name it we're there go with the heat you know how to find us that's where we are that's who we are go with the heat we would also love to see a review of the show it helps other people find the show it helps other people know that you listen to it go ahead and go to your podcast your platform of choice it could be things like anchor or stitcher or it could be just traditional rss like me us old people around here that still remember that rss exists and you could just add a link into a feed reader and you can listen to it anytime you want to go to that podcaster that podcatcher platform of choice give us five stars Whatever the highest rating is for jumping frogs, whatever the <laughs> highest rating is on that podcast platform, a choice, but don't review the show. No one ever reviews the show. Go ahead and put in the comments if they're going to make you put a comment. Tell us which one is your favorite eagle and why. <laughs> <laughs> Be sure to check out that website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the way to contact us, all the ways to subscribe to the show, get those RSS feeds, check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. We're in the middle of season four. We're starting to think ahead to what's going to happen at the end of Miami Vice. Go to that Patreon, show us some support, and let us know what you think about the future of Go With The Heat. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.